Mumbai. Our Gandhi lecture for this year will be delivered by Professor Usha Thakkar, President Mani Bhavan Gandhi Sangralay, Mumbai. The lecture is titled Gandhi in Bombay, Marching Towards Freedom. The Department of Interreligious Studies, DIRS, aims to cultivate wholesome relations between the practitioners of different religious and cultural traditions. The Indian subcontinent in particular and our human family in general has been blessed with a wide variety of cultures and religions. The DIRS works towards making this diverse social reality positive and productive in terms of communal harmony as well as national and global well-being. Besides organizing a variety of activities and events through the year, the DIRS hosts three public lectures every year, the Ambedkar Lecture, the Gandhi Lecture, and the Stan Swami Lecture. The Ambedkar Lecture highlights the importance of struggle for social justice. The Gandhi Lecture focuses on nonviolent activism towards social harmony, and the Stan Swami Lecture dwells on the recognition of the rights of indigenous and marginalized communities. Now, our speaker for this session is Dr. Usha Thakkar. Dr. Thakkar is the president of Mani Bhavan Gandhi Sangralay, Mumbai. She was also the vice president of Asiatic Society of Mumbai. The Asiatic Society has conferred an honorary fellowship on her. She has done her PhDs at University of Chicago, Cornell University and New York University. She has retired as professor and head, Department of Political Science, SNDT Women's University, Mumbai. She has contributed to many prestigious journals and has also presented papers at many national and international conferences. Some of her well-known publications are Gandhi in Bombay towards Swaraj, Understanding Gandhi, Gandhians in Conversation, with Fred J. Blum, Pushpanjali essays on Gandhian's themes in honor of Dr. Usha Mehta. Her research areas include Gandhian studies, women's studies, and Indian politics. Now, I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Amita Valmiki. She is the Associate Professor and Head of Department of Philosophy of Ram Niranjan Jinjanwala College of Arts, Science and Commerce and visiting faculty at Department of University of Mumbai. She was a member of Board of Studies in Logic and Philosophy, University of Mumbai. Her PhD thesis was on man, religion and society. She has been awarded twice postdoctoral research fellowship and has been visiting faculty at Department of Philosophy and Religious Theories at Bonn University, Germany. She has presented papers at various conferences, seminars, and colloquiums at national and international level. Her special areas of interest are ethics, theistic existentialism, philosophy of religion, mysticism, aesthetics, and philosophy of film. She has published a book titled Mystical Worlds, Social, Spiritual, and Secular, co-edited a book titled 100 Years of Indian Cinema, Issues and Challenges in Retrospection, and published more than 50 articles in various books and in national and international journals. She has organized national and international conferences at and colloquiums. She has been awarded Best Teacher in Philosophy by Maharashtra Tatpanyan Parishad in 2000, 2021. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand over to Dr. Usha Thakkar to take the discussion further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Father Keith D'Souza, Dr. Amita Valmiki, Dr. Radha Kumar, and my friends. I thank Department of Interreligious Studies, Xavier's College, and Dr. Father Keith D'Souza for inviting me. Thank you. And thanks, Jennifer, for your kind words of introduction. Now, the world has changed dramatically since Mahatma Gandhi lived and worked. There have been enormous changes 
in political, economic, and social scenes. However, trials, tribulations, and challenges faced by the Mahatma in his eventful life remain very important. The moral issues he raised are still relevant and the questions he posed for social, economic, and political justice still remain of crucial importance. It is important for us to remember that he inspired the people to think afresh about the denial of freedom by the British rule, his insistence on truth as the end and nonviolence as the means, his resolve to fight injustice, his advocacy of nonviolent ways of protest, and his persistence for constructive work made an impact on the people. As all of us know, at the young age of 19, he left India to study in England. While from years 1888 to 91 were spent in England, pursuing studies and widening the horizons, the years from 1892 to 1915 with occasional visits to India and England were spent in South Africa, exploring the new avenues of experimenting with Satyagraha. After his return to India, Gandhi left India only once in 1931 for a short time to go to England to attend the Roundtable Conference. The period from 1915 to his martyrdom on 30th January 1948 was dedicated to his motherland. He launched Satyagrahas against the colonial rule, mobilized Indians, addressed meetings, engaged in constructive work, traveled widely to different corners of India, from remote villages to glittering cities, opened the channels of communication with those in power and touched the lives and hearts of his countrymen. Now, amidst all these activities, Bombay, now Mumbai, remained very important for him. It was here that his voice found an echo. His activities got encouraging response. Many of his strategies got formed and a large number of his colleagues and flowers, followers assembled. Bombay took to him as one of its own. Now the idea of tracing the footsteps of Gandhi in Mumbai, then Bombay is very exciting. It helps us to understand Gandhi's philosophy, his ways of protest, his ways of working, his movements and city support to him. As one starts the journey through lanes and violence, of history, one feels overwhelmed. We learn that many records of words and deeds of Gandhi are available. The memories of Gandhi's times and work are treasured in some places in the city and glowing facts about his life and work are tucked in the pages of old books and the files of archives. I would also like to point out here that we always connect Gandhi with, with villages. Certainly, he encouraged people in rural life. He encouraged people to live in villages, to have better life in villages. But at the same time, he understood the value of an urban center like Bombay. And Bombay vibrated with unprecedented vitality and energy during the period of freedom struggle, the Rawlett Satyagraha, the non-cooperation movement, the civil disobedience movement, and the Quit India movement all demonstrated defiance and determination, fearlessness, and perseverance of the people in the city of Bombay. Gandhi's important nationwide movements are intertwined with the life in this city and its people. Now, Bombay, by the time of Gandhi's arrival in India was already a center of commerce, finance, and textile industry. 
It was also a hub of diverse intellectual and social reform activities. So meeting point of the East and the West, this port city had developed a strong cosmopolitan identity. So if Gandhi's leadership was magnetic, the city's response was magnificent. And Gandhi was full of energy and the city with vibrancy. This blending resulted in the powerful energy that made history. And this symbiotic relation between Gandhi and Bombay was spent over decades and could strengthen over time. Now, when Gandhi returned from South Africa to India, it was on 9th January 1915, and he was given a warm welcome by the city of Bombay. The Indian National Congress, political leaders, social reformers, and people had known his work for the indentured labor in South Africa. And Gandhi, who had left the shores of India in Western dress, had returned home dressed in Kathiawadi attire, that is dhoti, coat, and turban, with a determination to settle in India. Now, this was something very new in those times. The elite of Bombay were eager to welcome him. A number of receptions, political meetings, and civic functions were organized, drawing him into the vortex of activities and many social and political networks. Now, we get such detailed description of these meetings, but some of these functions were a grand reception presided by Perucha Mehta at Mount Petit, the residence of J.B. Petit at Pedal Road, with the presence of around 600 prominent citizens, both Indians and Europeans. A meeting at Hira Bagh, where Tilak praised Gandhi, and the garden party hosted by Gurjar Sabha and presided over by M. A. and Jinnah. And as a quick look at the history, we find that the vacuum in public life created by the demise of Firoz Shah Mehta and Gokhale in 1915 and Dada Bhai Navroji in 1917 was being felt. Gandhi's advent around this time was welcome and his presence was noticeable by 1918. He had launched Satyagraha in Champaran in 1917 and in Kheda in 1918 and they had attracted the attention of the country. Now he had said in Bombay that his experience in Kheda and Champaran had taught him that very important lessons. And the lesson was that if leaders move with the people, live with them, eat and drink with them, a momentous change will come about in two years. Now, Gandhi was quick to realize that the leaders have to be in constant touch with the people. Gandhi was also active propagating his ideas of Swadeshi, freedom of the press, and betterment of society. His understanding of the situation, his novel method of protest, his humility, his preference for the use of the mother tongue, and his ways of communicating and conducting vis-a-vis -vis the rulers and the poor had evoked a range of responses from awe to admiration and from criticism to praise, but unfazed by such responses and remaining firmly rooted in the soil, he was ready to face new challenges, determined to weave together different strands of politics and moral principles. Now a big challenge came in 1919. In 1919, the Rollett Bill was passed by the British government. This curbed the liberties of the Indians and gave sweeping coercive powers to the government. Gandhi felt that this bill was a severe blow to the freedom and rights of the individual. 
he called a nationwide satyagraha or passive resistance against Rowlett Act or Black Act as it was known in India. Agitation against the Rowlett Act brought Gandhi in the forefront and Bombay became the center stage. It was the center stage now. And Satyagraha was launched on 6th April and 6th April was called the Black Sunday, a momentous day for Bombay and the nation. The Bombay Chronicle carried a vivid account of the mass meeting and Gandhi's speech on its 7th April 1919 edition. Now, just to think, we are talking of more than a century back and how Gandhi must have motivated people and people must have been so impressed with him that now they are flocking around him. And the description provides us with the detail, the scene at Chopati. And I always wonder, and I always tell my young students that just imagine, Gandhi was staying in Mani Bhavan, right here. Chopati is not far off. He must have just walked there. And he was there at 6.30 in the morning. And he sat there, he took his bath in sea water, and volunteers started coming. People started coming and the crowd kept on swelling into one huge mass of people. And we have our records telling us that more than 50,000 people were there. And Gandhi exhorted people to take Swadeshi vow and said, no country has ever risen, no nation has ever been made without sacrifice. And we are trying an experiment of building up ourselves by self-sacrifice without resorting to violence in any shape or form. And these words must have made an impact on all the listeners. Because after this meeting, people proceeded to Madhavag, French Bridge, and then to Grand Road, and then in an open space in front of a mosque. Now all our students living in Mumbai, you are familiar with all the places, right? I can see a smile on Rachel's face, good. So Hartal in the city was a complete success. You see, I want, I'm giving the names so that we can connect with these places that, oh, these are also the places that were involved in our freedom struggle. So number of copies of the proscribed books like Gandhi's Hind Swaraj were printed for sale. Now, this is also an important technique of Gandhi. You know, he wants to reach people. Now, one of the ways to reach people is through the written word, the spoken word, because at that time we did not have the social media. Otherwise, Gandhi would have been a success there also. So these books were proscribed, Gandhi's book, Hind Swaraj, and other small books written by him, and also Life and uh, Address of Mustafa Kamal Pasha. So Gandhi and his colleagues decided to get them printed and to sell this book or booklet, which was costing four enas. They started selling in rupee, five rupee, ten rupees. And guess, who went around to sell them? Gandhi himself and Sarojini Naidu. They started selling these books and Gandhi notes in his autobiography that he could sell one book even for 50 rupees. 50 rupees was a big amount at that time. And the volunteers of the Satyagraha Sabha canvassed actively by publishing bulletins, calling public meetings to educate people against the law and asking them to sign the Satyagraha pledge. Now, Gandhi is a great editor also. We must not forget. So, Satyagrahi, an unregistered newsletter was issued by Gandhi on 7th April 1919 in defiance of the Indian Press Act. Now he's defying the government. And this was published from Mani Bhavan. The paper was of half sheet size and was priced one paisa. And it declared 
that the paper had not been registered under the law. The name of the editor was given, Mohandas Karamchar Gandhi. Address was that of Lebarnam Road, that means this house of Mani Bhavan. And on the top of the leaflet, it was written that please read, copy and circulate among friends and request them to copy and circulate this paper. Now, isn't it amazing how Gandhi and his colleagues have thought of ways to reach people? Then the Satyagraha against the Rollet Act could not achieve the immediate repeal of the act. It was repealed after two, three years. But however, what Gandhi achieved was remarkable. His aura transcended the local territories and spread throughout the country. The, Ro the Rollet Satyagraha had propelled Gandhi on the national political scene. And B. R. Nanda, a great scholar, he convincingly argues that Gandhi was the script writer, the producer, the director, and the main actor of the drama of Satyagraha. So, by now, Gandhi was interested with the role of guiding the nation. And Ravindranath Tagore, in his letter dated 12th April 1919, referred to him as Mahatmaji, an endearing title that was already engraved in the hearts of people. Then in 1920, Gandhi's call for non-cooperation became the clarion call. Frustrated with the policy of the British government, Gandhi launched non-cooperation movement on the Khilafat issue and the Punjab wrongs on 1st August 1920. Incidentally, Lokmanya Tilak died on the same day and the day was marked with fast strikes and processions. Now, Jaliawala massacre had angered the people and the unsympathetic treatment given by the British government to Turkey and Khalifa had annoyed the Muslims. So Gandhi is aware of them and he mentions that. And why it is later dated 1st August 1920 to the Viceroy, Gandhi returned the three medals, Kesare Hind gold medal granted to him by the British government for his humanitarian work in South Africa, the Zulu war medal and the Boer war medal. The program of non-cooperation included non-violent mass section, including boycott of the government affiliated schools, colleges, courts and foreign cloth, surrenders of honors and titles, resignations from government service and positions and non-payment of taxes. As the movement gathered momentum, also developed were programs for constructive work, such as promotion of Swadeshi, establishment of national educational institutions, spinning and khadi work, eradication of untouchability, prohibition, and promotion of Hindu-Muslim unity. Gandhi believed that activities of constructive work should accompany the agitational politics. He said that Swadeshi was as much a necessity of daily life as air, water, and food. The first Khadi Bhandar was opened and Charkha centers were opened in places like Lal Bagh, Kalba Devi, Khetwadi, and Chopati. Now here, let me tell you my young students that in Mani Bhavan also we have started Charkha class and usually we have them on Monday and Friday and they are free. So if you want to come, you're most welcome. It is at 3 p.m. And in 1921, Gandhi announced his resolve to collect a huge fund of rupees one crore for the Tilak Swaraj Fund by the end of June 1921. Now, I think one crore of rupees is a huge amount even now, isn't it? My students, yes. How Gandhi must have thought before 101 years? 
but he said we must collect and he put a time limit and it stimulated people to get actively involved in the nationalist activities of the country. Now Gandhi had great expectations from the people of Bombay and they did not disappoint him. Industrialists and merchants, individuals and associations, workers and artists, young and old, men and women, all responded to Gandhi's call and donated generously. We get such exciting descriptions of this fun collection drive of Gandhi. He covers so many places like um, right from Dadar to Parel to Mandvi to Burivli to Bandra to Girgam. I mean, it's amazing. So Bombay witnessed Gandhi, the fundraiser at his best. And Gandhi's resolve to collect an enormous amount of rupees, one crore for the Tilak Swaraj Fund. This amount was to be used for the purpose of winning Swaraj and promoting nationalist causes. But he wanted it by the end of June 1921. And it motivated the people to connect with the nationalist activities. And Gandhi went to various places. Right from Dadar, Parel, Mandvi, Sandras Road, you name a place and he visited. Santa Cruz and then Grant Road, Bandra, even Excelsior Theatre. And Ga the Bombay was the single largest contributor. It collected 37 and a half lakhs of rupees. It's amazing. Gandhi was naturally happy. He paid a tribute to Bombay. He wrote in Young India on 6th July 1921 that Bombay is beautiful, not for its big buildings, for most of them hide squalid poverty and dirt, not for its wealth, for most of it is derived from the blood of the masses, but for its world-renowned generosity. She enabled India to keep her promise. Now, after collecting Tilak Swaraj Fund, Gandhi concentrated attention to the issues of boycott of foreign cloth. And three bonfires were organized at the premises of Elphinstone Mills that were owned by Umar Sobani at Parel. And the first bonfire of foreign clothes was held on 31st July, 1921 and Gandhi said, I regard this day sacred for Bombay. We are removing today a pollution from our bodies. We are purifying ourselves by discarding foreign cloth, which is the badge of slavery. So for Gandhi, the foreign cloth is a symbol. It's a symbol of slavery. And khadi, which is hand spun yarn, is a symbol of freedom. Now in the second bonfire of foreign clothes, which was which took place in the evening of 9th October, again in the same place. And the third bonfire of foreign clothes was arranged on 17th November, same place. And it is recorded that there were more than 25,000 persons present. Now, things are moving fast. There are many changes on the political scene also. But if we come to late 20s and early 30s, we find that disappointed with unresponsive attitude of the British government, the Congress passed a resolution demanding a complete independence as its session at Lahore on 31st December 1929. I'm sure students must have studied it or will be studying about it sometime. And the Congress Working Committee met at Sabarmati Ashram in February 1930 and entrusted Gandhi with all the powers to launch the civil disobedience movement. Now, again, Gandhi comes out with something very different. He has 
decided to launch his satyagraha on the issue of salt. All the leaders are baffled. Everybody is wondering why this seemingly insignificant material to launch satyagraha. But then Gandhi is Gandhi. He turns ordinary into extraordinary. So if you see Gandhi's life, it's a journey from ordinary to extraordinary. And Gandhi started his historic Dandi march from Sabarmati Ashram to Dandi on 12th March 1930. And when he declared at Dandi on 5th April 1930 that I want world sympathy in the battle of right against might. The nation was drawn into a vortex of nationalist politics and the city was not to be left behind. And this Satyagraha attracted the attention of many countries and the foreign press. And Gandhi was aware of that. Let's not forget, he was a great editor and he was a master in the art of communication. So the suburb of Ville Parle, the Chopati Sea Beach and the Congress House at Girgaon became thriving centers of non-violent action. The raids on the Vadala Salt Depot was the highlight of Salt Satyagraha in Bombay. And we get impressive descriptions of the processions from Congress House to Lemington Road, Tardev, Chopati, Mahalakshmi and other places near the sea. Volunteers fetching sea water and boiling it for making salt. Now, all these areas are very familiar to you, my dear students, am I right? But just imagine how Gandhi and his... See, the best part about this Satyagraha, Gandhi is not in Bombay. Gandhi is at Dandi, but his followers and colleagues are at Bombay. And their response is tremendous because Bombay has taken lead in the salt Satyagraha. And leaders like K.F. Nariman, Avantika Bai Gokhale and Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay were in forefront. And a program of making salt in cement salt pens by boiling water was arranged on the terrace of the Congress House. You must have seen the Congress House. Just go and see it someday. It's a building right in the vicinity. And Kamla Devi and these people decided that we must make cement pans, bring the water from the sea, boil the water, make the salt and sell it so that people are getting more involved. And people were very excited. And we get such beautiful descriptions that how people started from Congress House and processions were in 5,000, 10,000, perhaps even more at times. And volunteers would bring seawater. And then Kamla Devi and Avantika Bai, they would start boiling the seawater on cigarettes or in the Congress House Terrace. And they would make salt. Now, this is the passion for Satyagraha. And around this time, a Prabhat fairies were very visible. Now, see, we all know about Prabhat fairies these days. And you say, yeah, there was a thing in the past where people moved around singing songs in the morning. Actually, at that time, it was much more. It was, Prabhat ferry was supposed to be the message of revolution, non-violent revolution. And there are so many young people who died, who sacrificed themselves while leading the Prabhat fairies. I would like to give you one example that there was one young man, Hargovin Lalji, in Muleshwar area, and he had a Pavagad Vijay Prabhat ferry group. And he started his Prabhat ferry with her national flag. And he was asked by the British authorities that get lost. He said no. And ultimately, they hit him. He fell down and he died. 
This was 4th August 1930. Now, just imagine how many unknown people have sacrificed their lives for freedom. And so many unknown men and women in our city also. And I would also like to draw your attention to one delightful fact that during this time, 1930 also, there were Ganpati festival. These days also we enjoy Ganpati festival in Mumbai. And a noticeable feature of the Ganpati festival at that time was that parties carrying the Ganpati had a Congress flag in front of them. And some images of Ganpati were also wearing Gandhi caps. Isn't it cute? And strong message to the government in 1930. And there was notable picketing against liquor and foreign cloth. Now, another incident also I would like to talk about, especially to my young friends, that is of a martyr. That on 12th December 1930, Babu Genu, a mill worker, offered courageous satyagraha by trying to prevent a truck carrying foreign cloth and sacrificed his life as the truck crushed him because the truck would not wait. So the martyr dam of Babu Genu moved the people and women led the funeral procession with the mortal remains of Babu Genu and set the torch to the pyre. The participation of women in the freedom struggle was spectacular. So you see, even if you now, if you go to that area, you can see Babu Genu Lane. Now, one thing was very clear after 1930s, that the repressive steps of the government no longer frightened the people in Bombay. Merchants, shopkeepers, women, and students got engrossed in Gandhi's political activities. Going to jail was no longer a stigma but an honor. Observing Hartal was no longer a solitary protest, but a part of the mainstream connected with the national movement. So non-violent demonstrations and meetings in the city became familiar sites. Then soon thereafter, the talks between Gandhi and the Congress on one hand and with the government on the other hand continued and the proposal of roundtable conference seemed to be acceptable. So the Congress Working Committee decided that Gandhi should represent the Congress at the roundtable conference in London. Now here, excuse me. I would like to point out that a special passport what was issued to Gandhi in 24 hours time. Because you see, Gandhi has decided that he is going to be rooted in India only. Now what's the use of passport? But now because he had to go, the government became very active. And a noteworthy feature of this passport was that his birth year was wrong in the passport. We all know he is born in 1869, but the passport mentions 1870. And we have a copy of the passport in Mani Bhavan. You can also see it yourself whenever you come. And um, he sailed to London on 29th August 1931 by SS Rajputana to attend the second roundtable conference in London. And he returned on December 28, 1931 with large crowds warming, warmly welcoming him. See, here also you get such pretty descriptions that as he landed, how he came to Mani Bhavan and, you know, all the houses were garlanded, people were standing on the roads, people were looking at him from the balconies, from windows, just try to visualize the picture. We do not have the photographs of those times of these activities, but I think it must be pretty exciting. It was like a festival in the city. Festival for freedom. Festival for their leader. And after coming back 
he had many meetings and uh, but he knew that his visit was not a success so he he said to the people may god give us the strength to suffer and sacrifice in the cause of freedom under the heavy pressure gandhi was unruffled unperturbed and on the evening of 3rd january he wrote to tagore i want you to give your best to the sacrificial fire that is lighted see the words he chooses now we have a copy of this also in mani bhavan which is framed when you can when you come to mani bhavan you can see that and his message to the people was unambiguous he said in an interview with bombay chronicle again on 3rd january 1932 what i would ask the nation to do after my arrest is to wake up from its sleep see gandhi is the master when it comes to the expression he says wake up from this sleep and the nation does wake up now i would also like to share this with you that you may have heard the name of verier elvin he was renowned anthropologist and tribal activist he he has given a touching description of the scene on 3rd january night in mani bhavan he had been invited by gandhi to stay with him at mani bhavan and he says there was great excitement in the city because the viceroy had finally rejected the congress offer of peace nehru was already in jail arrest of other national leaders was expected at any moment but when we reached mani bhavan and climbed to the roof we found a great serenity in astonishing contrast to the crowds and turmoil outside the roof was a pleasant place it still is you can come and see low tents has been erected and there were palms and plants at least 300 people could gather there it was cool and you could see the stars i felt i had to keep vigil and for hours i was under those splendid stars that rose tire upon tire above me while beside me babu slept like a child committed to his father's hands i thought of christ going to jerusalem his eyes filled with determination and courage now gandhi knew he was to be arrested so he had given instructions he had given his um, whatever he wanted uh, his dictations for the letters and everything and concerned with this tense situation the government decided to arrest gandhi on 4th january 1932 around 3 am just imagine in the early morning 3 to 4 am why that time because the government also must have thought that if gandhi was would be arrested in the day time people would rise and there would be great agitation station which they did not want so around 3 am on 4th january the police arrived to arrest gandhi with gs wilson the police commissioner now i think we are fortunate we also got a little detail about <clears throat> what mr wilson did and how he arrested gandhi we found from his diary he has written i read out the warrant to him and touched his shoulder in token of having arrested him and told him that i would give him half an hour to get ready asking the paper and pencil he wrote because it was his silent day i will be ready in exactly half an hour and he was ready meera ben collected gandhi's kit and made preparations for morning prayer now what would be gandhi's jail kit all of you can imagine charkha little mattress one thela fruit basket sandals maybe bottle of milk that's it that was his jail kit so the prayer was held on the terrace of mani bhavan everybody sang vaishnava janato tene kahiye je pid 
parai jane re and gandhi was arrested but the people continued with their nationalist activities fearlessly the city had observed a complete hartal on gandhi's arrest and procession of thousands of men and women marched and a mass meeting was held at azad maidan oppressive ordinances were promulgated on 4th january 1932 and from the date the congress and the allied organizations were declared illegal and if we see the government records we find that between january 1932 and april 1933 as many as 14101 persons including 939 women were convicted in the bombay presidency now these are official figures so gandhi's leadership had certainly made a difference to the political atmosphere of bombay in the words of k munshi political consciousness so far confined to a section of the highly educated in the city began to filter down to the middle class both upper and lower and flowering during the gandhian movement of 1930 it made bombay the citadel of national movement i think this description fits bombay so well the citadel of national movement now even after this gandhi is in jail but people are working gandhi sending messages and gandhi will pick up his constructive work so his emphasis on decentralization community based economics self sufficiency spinning promotion of khadi handicrafts village industries hindu muslim unity national education removal of untouchability and other harmful social practices outlines his vision of a self sufficient economy and a just society and i think today also we need to learn a lot from this vision because it presents a human face of development now bipin chandra rightly observes that constructive work was basic to a war of position it played a crucial role during the passive phase in filling the political space felt vacant by the withdrawal of civil disobedience thus solving a basic problem that a mass movement faces that is how to sustain a sense of activism in the non mass movement phases of struggle so that is why the constructive work keeps the tempo of the movement now when the world now again the political scene moves fast when the world war second broke out in 1939 the british government declared india a belligerent country without her consent the congress did not approve of this there were intense deliberations and meetings people under gandhi's leadership were getting prepared for the great struggle ahead and talking about the movement gandhi said when i launched it i had no foolish illusion about a sudden miracle happening it was conceived to be and it remains a silent declaration of unquenchable faith in the power of non violence even in the midst of circumstances so terrible and so baffling as face the world today the ideas of a strong protest against the british rule had started taking concrete shapes by july 1942 the resolution passed by the working committee at varda on 14 july was a bold resolve asking that the british rule in india must end immediately and placing the widespread struggle inevitably under the leadership of gandhi it stressed that india needs to feel the glow of freedom i think this expression beautifully captures the idea and the ai cc that met in bombay in august endorsed the resolution substantially in the same language and quit india 
the slogan given by Gandhi was a master stroke of Gandhi, not only in the directness and force of the words, but also in its power to energize people. I have been fortunate. I have met some freedom fighters who have talked about these times. And they, when they say, quit India, Hindi Chodo, I tell you, I could see the glow of freedom on their faces. So that's something remarkable. And there were huge meetings in the city, including one at Chopati on 2nd August with 50,000 people. Just visualize. And Vallabhai Patel was the main speaker. The AICC session on 7th and 8th August left its indelible mark on history. You know the place, you please visit someday. August Kranti Meda, Gowalia Tank. It was known at that time as Gowalia Tank. And the gathering was attended by prominent national leaders and notable persons from Bombay. And they had a special elected pandal. Now, you see, we get such good descriptions of this, but I don't want to get into that. And the AI says, let's come back to the resolution. What did they decide? So AICC resolved to sanction for the vindication of India's inalienable right to freedom and independence, the starting of a mass struggle on nonviolent lines on the widest possible scale, so that the country might utilize all the nonviolent strength it has gathered during the last 22 years of peaceful struggle. Such a struggle must inevitably be under leadership of Gandhiji, and the committee requests him to take the lead and guide the nation in the steps to be taken. The AICC resolution was moved by Jawaharlal Nehru and seconded by Sardar Patel. In his speech at AICC, on 7th August, Gandhi had stressed the importance of nonviolence. Again, his words are very, should I say, evoke, the evocative. They transform, they transcend us and they take us back to those times in 1942. He says at a time when I am about to launch the biggest fight in my life, there can be no hatred for the British in my heart. Nonviolence is a matchless weapon which can help everyone. And when I raise the slogan, quit India, the people in India who were, the, who were then feeling despondent felt I had placed before them a new thing. It was an energizing slogan. And on 8th August, he congratulated all those who passed the resolution and stressed that in Satyagraha, there is no place for fraud or falsehood or any kind of untruth. Every one of you should, from this moment onwards, consider yourself a free man or a woman and act as if you are free and you are no longer under the heel of imperialism. And then his words, they're so significant. He says, the bond of the slave is snapped the moment he considers himself to be a free being. And here is a mantra and a short one that I give you. You may imprint it in your heart and let every breath of yours give expression to it. The mantra is do or die. We shall either free India or die in the attempt. We shall not live to see the perpetuation of our slavery. Let every man and woman live every moment of his or her life hereafter in the consciousness that he or she eats or lives for achieving freedom and will die if need be. Such powerful words. They created remarkable, important. I find it difficult to describe because again, getting back to the past, my own professor, uh, Dr. 
Usha Mehta, you must have heard about it and some of your teachers must have met her. She was here at this meeting. And when she used to talk about it, she said, we just felt frozen and then energized. We just thought we had to do something. So Gandhi's words were very powerful. The British government, however, was in no mood to loosen its grip over India. Gandhi and Congress leaders were arrested on 9th August. Oppressive steps were taken throughout India. But Aruna Safali, the young firebrand leader, emerged like a lightning in the morning of 9th, unfurled the national flag at Gowalia tank and went underground. Now, the leaders were sent to jail, some to Yerevda, some to Ahmednagar fort. Gandhi and his colleagues were taken to Aga Khan palace. And Gandhi's arrest marked the launch of the movement in a spontaneous way. The city plunged into hartals, procession, demonstrations, and outburst of popular unrest. The government took recourse to arrest and firing, but then led to further chaos and disorder. Unrest spread to interiors of Bombay presidency. There were instances of throwing stones in soda water bottles at trams, buses, cars, and police in Bombay. And attempts were also made to damage post offices, railway station, and government property. The youth diverted, unfortunately, to violent methods like exploding bombs and going underground. As is recorded, Bombay became not only the venue of the historic AICC session, it also became the important site where discontent and protest of the people were expressed. Now, Am I transgressing the time limit or can I speak for five, seven minutes more? Definitely yes, not. Amit. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. please. Okay. Now you see, I would like to read out the this, that following the protests and agitation, Viceroy Lord Linlithgow wrote to Churchill, the Prime Minister of England at that time on 31st August, 1942, that I am engaged herein, meeting by far the most serious rebellion since that of 1857, the gravity and extent of which we have so far concealed from the world for reasons of military security. Now, it, this speaks volumes of the in intensity of the movement. And women as in earlier movements played a remarkable role, undaunted by the fear of arrest or police repression, they removed the shackles of traditions and customs and participated in political activities with rare courage. Now, earlier also I had uh, mentioned my professor, Dr. Usha Mehta. I would just like to mention here that Usha Mehta and her colleagues, they had started an underground Congress radio. Now you see, my young friends would say, oh, this time in this area of advanced technology, what is radio? But in 1942 August, where the government had banned all the communications and news, it really played a very important role because it gave the news of the movement and other important national and international news. And it was so wonderful, Usha Ben remembering her days because she used to say, we used to announce that this is the Congress radio calling on 42.34 meters from somewhere in India. And almost for three months, the government could not arrest them. Finally, they were arrested. Babu Bhai Khakkar got imprisonment for five years, Usha Ben for four years, Chandrakan Javeri for one year, and Vithal Bhai Javeri and Nanak Mutwane were acquitted of charges. <clears throat> this Congress radio case can be a book by itself. Now the 
movement of 1942 was the last inner freedom struggle and the most important because Bombay became a nerve center, drawing people from all sections and all corners of India. And recollecting those times, Aruna Asafali had said later that I was but a splinter of the lava thrown up by the volcanic eruption of a people's indignation. Such beautiful expression. But I think this catches the essence. So then there was an effort for uh, some solution and Gandhi Jinnah meeting took place on 9th September in Bombay. The talks lasted for 18 days, but unfortunately they did not yield any result. And then the news of Gandhi's assassination on 30th January 1948 brought grief and sadness to the city. 300,000 paid silent homage at the beaches outside Bombay, dipping themselves in the sea as the radio announced that Gandhi's funeral pyre had been lighted. People of Bombay paid the last homage to their much-loved leader when the urn containing a portion of Mahatma's ashes were kept on view in the town hall in February 1948. And more than five lakhs people formed the procession of 12th February for the immersion of Gandhi's ashes in the Arabian Sea at Chopati. Now, well-known leaders as well as little known or unknown men and women in Bombay played major roles. They created history with passion for motherland and mission for freedom. If Gandhi's leadership was charismatic, their participation was astounding. Though they had their moments of despair and dissolution, they surpassed the obstacles of outbursts of violence and repression by the British. So together, Gandhi and Bombay opened uncharted avenues to reach the destination of independence. Bombay has remained important to Gandhi throughout his life. People of Bombay were always with him in protest, movement, and constructive work. Various parts of the city of memories of processions, hartals, picketing against shops of foreign cloth and liquor, flag salutation, ceremonies, and meetings. Now his meetings went beyond the concrete confines of halls, such as Congress House, Morarji Gokaldas Hall, Royal Opera House, Muzaffarabad Hall, and Jinnah Hall. But open grounds like Chopati Sands, Juhu, space near Shantaram Chol, or the French Bridge, or Esplanade or Azad Maidan could be effortlessly converted into sites for huge meetings by Gandhi and his colleagues during the freedom struggle. And that brings us to Mani Bhavan, this place hollowed by the presence of Mahatma, where Gandhiji used to stay here whenever he would come between 1917 and 1934. Now, Bombay has nurtured him. And it has responded positively to Gandhi's call for Tilak Swaraj Fund, Kasturba Fund, and Harijan Fund. Gandhi also stayed twice at Juhu when his health was not so good. So it, lastly, I would like to say that it was in Bombay that he found his trusted colleagues who came from diverse backgrounds and ideologies. He had colleagues like Benjamin Horniman, Umar Sobani, Shankarlal Bankar, Jamna Das, and Kanji Dwarkadas, Vithalbhai Patel, Munshi, and Bhulabhai Desai in earlier years. And later, in 1934, he got, sorry, 1930s, he got people like Yusuf Mehrali, B.G. Kher, S.K. Patil and Shankar Rao there. And in 1942, his support came from socialist leaders like Ram Manohar Loya, 
Achyutrao Patwardhan, Ashok Mehta, and Jai Prakash Narayan. And Gandhi was backed by many women leaders like Avantika Bai Gokhale, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, Parin Captain Hansa Mehta, Lelavati Munshi, and Ratan Mehta. He had also backing of many associations like Cotton Brokers Association, Grain Merchants Association, Indian Merchants Chamber, and others. But the youth, especially in 1942, were great supporters of Gandhi. Students from institutions like Wilson College, Elphinstone College, Sydenham College, Ruya College, Khalsa College, and VJTI were active during the movement. So the relation between Gandhi and Bombay is spread over chronicles of meetings, protest, political actions, mass mobilizations, hartals, fasts, and people's aspirations, all capturing powerful moments of unfolding nationalism at local level. Processions of Khadi clad men and women on the streets, young and old bearing the lathi blows, courting prison, women picketing against shops of foreign cloth and liquor fearlessly and spinning tirelessly. Gandhi calling for Satyagraha, building his teams, his meetings swelling in thousands. All these are scenes of our story, people's struggles sufferings and sacrifices to achieve independence and telling and retelling of the story and the leader is important because there are many large and little pieces of information about Gandhi in Bombay, but put together, they make a rainbow collage that presents a story of this remarkable relation between the extraordinary leader and the extraordinary city our Mumbai. A real look at this collage is both refreshing and enriching. So thank you. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, yeah. thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank Madam, you. it was really very, very intriguing, the talk. Um, I would really like to speak a few words, uh, what I collected because I was going on typing uh, what I was uh, noting down everything, um, collecting uh, things from the talk. First of all, I'm extremely thankful to Dr. Rajendra Shinde, Director, the Department of Interreligious Studies, uh, Dr. Keith D'Souza, Associate Professor in the Department of Ancient Indian History, Culture and Archaeology, Dr. Radha Kumar for giving me this opportunity to moderate the session on Gandhi in Bombay, marching towards freedom by none other than uh, Usha Mehta, uh, Thakarji. And Mehta also, it doesn't matter much. <laughs> uh, Professor Thakar, thank you so much for your highly intriguing and captivating talk. Thank you. Uh, to, to summarize the talk, uh, what was reflecting in my mind all the time during this talk was that uh, um, if Mohandas Karanchan Gandhi's life and philosophy was relevant in his time, it is equally relevant in contemporary times as well. Gandhi, a torchbearer for values of non-violence, Satyagraha and Swaraj is an undeniably the most powerful personality in Indian history. Um, it reminds me of painter Atul Dodia who mentioned in an interview, uh, as an artist, I quote him, as an artist, whenever I looked at Gandhi's photographs, I felt that he was approachable and understood the feelings of common people. As I reflected on him, I began to feel he was India's first conceptual artist who used various ways to convey his message and reach out to people. Look at the sheer act of picking salt at Gandhi. Aesthetically, he began to encourage me, unquote. Gandhi's philosophy and practice of non-violence in relation to truth, goodness, and beauty is based on his inner aesthetic sense. As Gandhi said, Ahimsa truly understood is in my humble opinion, a penance for all evils, mundane or extra mundane. We can never overdo it. So, um, but we are forgetting it, you know. So Mahatma Gandhi lived in Mumbai 
then called Bombay for several years. He worked as a lawyer in Bombay and almost for three decades fought for freedom of India living in Bombay. Martin Luther King said, Gandhi was inevitable. If humanity is to progress, Gandhi is inescapable. We may ignore Gandhi at our own risk, he says. So um, why Gandhi chose in Bombay for his non-cooperation movement, with India movement, and many activities in the struggle of independence of India? What was so striking that Gandhi selected Bombay as his main hub for different activities in freedom struggle and not for any other, or not any other city of India. Gandhi had vociferous supporters from different communities in Bombay, of Bombay, to name few, the Bhatias, the Maimans, the Bohras, the Vanias, that is the Baniyas, and many more. Now, these comprised of traders and small merchants. Mani Bhavan was his residence from 1917 to 1934. The place dropped with the innovative activities that Gandhi initiated against British rule. Gandhi found Mumbai to be the city very viable for fundraising raising funds. The book uh, Gandhi in Bombay towards Swaraj, authored by our own Usha Thakarji and Sandhya Mehta brings back to our memory the Gandhian enterprise of different freedom movements after he receiving a grandeur welcome in Bombay coming back from South Africa. Once again, thank you so much, Professor Thakar. Madam, I will ask you, uh, I will take up the question uh, from the chat box, but before that, I would like to ask you one question if you permit yeah, so. Yeah. Um, um, can you call Gandhi um, a person who brought about uh, you know, the concept of deconstruction in a postmodern sense? Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always felt mm -hmm. so. Uh, was all these things, uh, uh, all these movement and activities that he did, and he did it with full heart and soul in it. Um, do you think this uh, depended on his aesthetic on sense? His? Uh, his sense of aesthetics, that means uh, going for a sattvic, uh, you, know, um, um, you know, white clothes and uh, all these things uh, were very, very, I always felt that it was, a, this, uh, you know, the sort of aesthetic sense that was there in all these activities and why we always see him as one of the great political leaders only or uh, because as uh, as Atul Dodia says that he was the first conceptual artist so do you think there is some hidden aesthetic sense in it because even even the whole idea of deconstruction you know the orthodoxy was was shattered by him and at the same time he was uh, uh, into uh, into accepting many things that uh, British came uh, you know uh, he was was not avert to all these things, but at the same time going back to his roots. So is he understood in paradoxes? I yes, I mean, I mean, you what you have expressed is so direct and at the same time so very well presented. The way I look at Gandhi is that you know, Gandhi is a person who belongs to the people, at the same time, he can stand on his own. So like uh, J.B. Kriplani at one place has said that uh, Gandhi can stand on his own feet. So to my, I mean, whenever I talk to students, once I was talking and one girl said, ah, jara hatke hai. So I said, yes, jara hatke hai. That's it. So Gandhi visualized and conceptual. This is what I feel. That yes. his every move is conceptualized. He has clear vision where he is going to go and at the same time he does not want to go the usual way he yeah. charts his own unusual uncharted way and there I mean I also tend to agree with you that there is something remarkable is about his aesthetics he is not an artist or we cannot say that oh he would um, praise the beauty of nature not in the literal sense, but... Yeah, but, you know, at the same time, he appreciates the beauty of the soul. soul. That's the way I look at it. And that is why everything around him is in proper place. Proper. 
Yes. Actually, see, even his loincloth, if you see, the folds are so neat. Absolutely. That is a statement. The yeah. way he keeps his watch, it's a statement. Yes. So I think for him, the life is as a whole. The, and I think this is the beauty of it. That because, and this is the way I think, that because he sees life as a whole, so there are no compartments. Mm -hmm. So everything is one. And for him, as we noted earlier, for him, ugliness is only the exploitation of the poor. Yes. But otherwise, things are good. Absolutely. And actually, this was the reason why people were attracted spontaneously to Gandhi. Yeah. 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 Very yeah. true. Now I'll be taking questions from the chat box. We have our uh, very good friend, uh, Professor Mangesh Kulkarni from Yaya. Yeah, yeah, he's there. And... Uh, from the very beginning, he's there. Uh, thank you, sir, for being there. Uh, he has asked a very important uh, question, pertinent question. Gandhi was close to the capitalists. What were the implications for the working classes? Hi, Mangesh. When I read the question, I knew it has to be you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. He was my colleague at SNDT. Okay. Yeah. Yes, you know, you have a point. I mean, I would not say that Gandhi was with the capitalists, but there's one thing that you know, he has not emerged as a labor leader, but he's people's leader. So that is the difference. And I would not say that he was only the friend of the capitalists because so many ordinary people have contributed to his funds and actually his movements in Mumbai or in Bombay have become successful because of the support of the so-called ordinary people. The way our shopkeepers responded, they closed their shops. I think these things are very important. Otherwise Gandhi would not have been so successful just with the help or support of the capitalists. I mean, they were there, they supported him, but there were times when he fell on the support from these ordinary people. In fact, B.R. Nanda has noted that uh, it was not that Gandhi had support of only capitalists, but so many people from the so-called ordinary people contributed to his activities. I mean, that's the way I look at it. Yeah. Ma'am, you're on mute. You're on mute. Amit, you're on yeah. mute. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Raj Karya is asking, has there been any correspondence or meeting between Gandhi and artists from the turn of the century, such as members of Bombay Art Society? You mean to say whether there is any correspondence? You see, there are so many. I mean, to say between Gandhi that, you know, I'll have to find from the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. But yes. I... Can, can I clarify my question? Yes, please. Yeah, sorry, uh, just a minute. I'll just... So what I meant is that while asking, because recently, at least while visiting the art galleries in Mumbai, art yeah. seems to be political uh, in the sense that it is attached with the political message. But when I go to like the CSMVS or, you know, Bhavdaji Lad Museum, the artworks which are displayed are not necessarily political from that era. So I was just wondering if Gandhi would have had any influence. Now, see, I do not know about Gandhi's influence on artists, but certainly a great influence on the newspapers and the cartoons. We get a lot of cartoons and I think somebody needs to study that. There have been one or two studies, but it would be a very fascinating study. And um, I think also Gandhi, how he attracts the artist today. And to give you another example, maybe it's not very relevant, but you know, we organize at Mani Bhavan the painting competitions for children. The children, say from age 7, 8 to 14, 15, and they draw beautiful paintings of Gandhi. And in fact, a friend of ours, 
uh, she's a sociologist and she has curated these paintings as a museum. It is on our website of Mani Bhavan. If you can see that beef is for Bapu, that you know how children view Gandhi. And of course, like artists like Dodi and of, they are very influenced by Gandhi. So I think Gandhi comes back to us, maybe in different ways. Maybe he need not come with a brand name Gandhi. But I think whenever we talk of non-violence, we hear of non-violent protests, we remember Gandhi. So I think that this idea is important. The idea of non-violence, the idea of beauty of the soul, idea of moral values, that is important for us. May I, may I just uh, add something to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, hello. Uh, can we take up another question? Because uh, we are running short of time. If you don't mind, Raj. But then, you know, you please contact me at Mani Bhavan and you are welcome. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I didn't uh, unmute. I did uh, not unmute, ma'am. It was... Uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Mangesh Kulkani on Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh, just okay. One, one yeah. line, just one line to say that Nandalal Bose, who was a very, very major painter of that time, actually was directly influenced by Gandhiji. And, uh, you know, he produced artworks, at least one of which depicts Gandhiji, in fact. We just have to Google it and you'll see. And later on, he went on to illustrate the Indian constitution. Nandalal Bose. Yeah. Give and just an example. Mangesh, Mangesh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Nandalal Bose and we can say we have one of his prints in Manibhan also, two of yeah. his oh, prints. Great. Yes. Great, great. And also, Mangesh, there are many uh, uh, other uh, anonymous artists. Uh, if you just Google, uh, you come to know that there are many paintings and many uh, installations being done by many people who have uh, not given their names. So this is also very intriguing, you know, that... Uh, he influenced a lot um, so many artists oh, can i can i just add something and dr amita yeah I just, yeah i just remembered that you know the students of vijay ti in 1920 late 1920s i think 28 they wanted to view portrait of gandhi and they were not allowed and there was so much ag agitation for it and finally there was satyagraha you can say kind of satyagraha and ultimately students did what they wanted, but it took them some years. So this was also okay. Frustration of their creativity. Yeah. Raj, I am sorry. So we have uh, Mr. Denard who is asking a question: Was Gandhi seen as a religious figurehead, or was he viewed as a political activist mobilizer among the Bombay masses? Um, sorry, he was viewed as a religious teacher, or no, no. Um, was Gandhi seen as a religious figurehead or was he viewed as a political activist or a mobilizer among the Bombay masses? I think I would say that, you know, he was a political mobilizer. I mean, he, he says that I'm a Hindu, yes. but he always used to say that I respect or I like the manyness of religion. So he had respect for all religions, and uh, but he never... Uh, said that I'm not Hindu. He said, I'm a Hindu. But then that is it. I respect my religion and you have to, I respect your religion also. So I personally feel that he was a great mobilizer and people's leader. Yeah. We have a question from Rachel Andrews. Uh, she says, uh, she asks, since you have studied Gandhi through and through, do you think Gandhi would be happy with the Bombay of today? Does it require to study Gandhi? <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I think I would just say that times have changed. People have changed. Cities have changed. But still, I do not leave hope. I'm still hopeful about the young generation. I still have hopes into them. Maybe they will find their own way. And uh, what should I say? That you know, every age find, finds its own Gandhi. Yeah. Now, this age will definitely find its own Gandhi, maybe in a different way. 
But yes, city has definitely changed. But then so many things have changed. And we may not like so much of technology, but technology is also benefiting the people. So it is up to us, the people, to try to make changes. And we may not really change the city completely. But as Gandhi said, one step at a time. That will be good. Here, uh, uh, Mangesh Kulkarni uh, uh, mentions, uh, just comments. Just remember that Bombay was always referred to as Mumbai, both by Gujarati speaking and Marathi speaking people. I think this is in uh, in uh, response to the what uh, comment you just uh, gave now. Yeah. yeah. So um, we have next question by Aman Kayal. Uh, he asks, uh, we generally differentiate between Gandhi and Ambedkar. Could you give some uh, more insight on similarities? See, I, I think that requires a different seminar altogether. <laughs> so maybe we can tackle it some other time. But I would say that both were genuinely, genuinely involved with the people, with the good life of the people. And, you know, both came from different experiences. So they had very different viewpoints. But I personally feel that they both work you dislike in Gandhi and uh, one student tells that you know I don't like this idea that you know we all have read about Gandhi looking after the pencil and preserving the pencil she is telling when I'm going to grow up I'll be a business executive and I will have no time to preserve my pencil so I said okay but tell me what do you like in Gandhi and uh, he thought over and he said, I like his idea of speaking the truth. Why do, why do you like it? See, actually, that saves many problems in life. At present, I have to say one thing to my mother and another thing to my girlfriend. <laughs> I start speaking the truth. I mean, I've not pursued him after that, but yes, it would have been worth it. But I think this is it. So, you know, as we know Gandhi, as we explore his life, we wonder, what is this? And uh, in fact, there are many interviews, some of them I'd edited in that um, book, that volume, Understanding Gandhi. Mm -hmm. And there are so many things his own colleagues say that we do not agree. Because maybe at times he was getting too rigid. But then, I think Gandhi is Gandhi. Somewhere he touches the heart. And that's it. It is not even melting your heart. You feel you can easily connect to him. And I think you can even tell him that, look, I don't like this element in you. You can even quarrel with Gandhi. And I think that is the beauty of our relation with him. Yes. Thank you so much for this highly, highly enlightening talk. Okay. And I'm thrilled. And uh, um, um, so many things now to pen down, you know, so many things and so many ideas related to Gandhi. I'm extremely thankful to you on mm -hmm. behalf of uh, this forum and also thankful to Radhaji for inviting me to moderate. I hope I have done my duty a bit of, um, uh, not as a perfectionist, but at least tried my best to do it. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. So well, thank you so much and thank, thank you all of you, all of you. And, yeah. Um, can I request yes. our student to propose the vote of thanks? Uh, can you please un, uh, come on video? Thank you. Thank you so much, Suraj. Um, and as we reach the end of this fruitful lecture, uh, on behalf of the entire organizing team, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to everyone who helped in making this event a sweet success as it is. Firstly, I would like to thank you, uh, 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 our speaker, thank our speaker, Professor Usha Thakkar, 
for sharing her immaculate knowledge on uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, the man who actually released us from the chains of oppression. Uh, from the moment I've, from the moment we've been looking at you, the way your voice and your face brightens up when you speak about Gandhi, for ensuring the students' interest and engaging in their questions, uh, and also remarking on the significance of Bombay as a place uh, of Gandhi and different parts of his life, I would like to thank you for your valuable time and your pearls of wisdom. I would also like to extend my sincere gratitude to the moderator of today's event, Professor, uh, Professor Amita Valmiki, who brilliantly created a bridge and patiently, that is an important thing between the speakers, uh, between the speaker and the audience members. As always, a lot of gratitude to our principal, Dr. Rajendra Shinde, um, the director of DIRS, uh, rector of Father Keith D'Souza, uh, the DIRS faculty in charge, uh, Dr. Radha Kumar, uh, for always being a rock of support to the entire DIRS team. Um, and I could not forget to thank our student leader, Jill Patel, and all the heads and volunteers of each department for ensuring that this event goes through such a smooth and efficient flow with their hard work. And lastly, I would also like to thank all our participants and audience members for lighting this event with their presence and their interest and getting to know something which is very important. Uh, at last, I would just like to remark one thing. In a few moments, uh, a feedback form will be sent on the chat box and I would request all the audience members to just fill it because it would not only ensure your presence, it will also help our team to look after the future events that we'll be able to plan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank, you so much. thank you, Suraj. Uh, Jill, we can stop recording.